So let's get started. My name is Josh Hausman. I'm uh, an associate professor here at the University of Michigan in the Public Policy School and um, also have a courtesy appointment in the Economics Department. And I am so pleased to be uh, to be introducing today um, Tetsuji Okazaki, who'll be telling talking to us about some Japanese economic history. Before I get to that, though, I want to make a couple of general announcements from the Center for Japanese Studies. So first is that tonight there's the eighth entry in uh, this uh, wonderful Japanese film series that the Center for Japanese Studies is sponsoring at the State Theater called Diamonds uh, by the Decade. And the film tonight uh, is from the, the decade of the 2000s um, uh, called uh, Tony uh, Takatani, directed by Jun Ichikawa. And that's at the State Theater uh, in Theater One at 7.15 p.m. You can go to the Michigan Theater website if you're interested in attending that. I also want to announce that two weeks from today, um, I believe I'm actually going to be hosting this lecture as well in the Center for Japanese Studies. There's going to be a talk by uh, Patty uh, McLaughlin called Betting on the Farm, Institutional Change in Japanese Agriculture, uh, which I think will be be quite interesting. That's by uh, Professor uh, Patty McLaughlin, as I said, who's a professor of government uh, and Japanese studies at the University of Texas. Uh, finally, just a, a uh, logistical note that for attendees joining online right now on the webinar, webcams and microphones have been muted, but uh, so please use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions. And I'll be looking at those questions and then during the, the Q&A, uh, I'll try to ask uh, as many of those as possible. Also, just to note that closed captioning, the live uh, transcript is on on Zoom. Uh, you can turn that off uh, if you would like. Uh, finally, let me just say that there, there are many wonderful Center for Japanese Studies events. Uh, so please go to the Center for Japanese Studies uh, webpage uh, if you are interested in, in uh, future lectures uh, and other uh, CJS events. OK, so with that, I would like to introduce our speaker uh, today, uh, Professor uh, Tetsuji Okazaki, who has come here uh, from Tokyo. So. Professor Okazaki is a, a very distinguished economic historian who has done extensive work on Japanese economic history. He was president of the International Economic History Association from 2015 to 2018. He's published extensively in all the major journals in economic history and general interest journals like the American Economic Review. His uh, recent interests include the history of Japan uh, during World War II and we're going to see an example of that today as he talks to us about wartime economic controls uh, in the Japanese cotton spinning industry. So I'm I'm excited uh, for the lecture. And uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Professor Okazaki. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you just for the uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, my name is, is Tetsujo Kazaki from the University of Tokyo. I'm very happy to have a chance to give a lecture at the uh, Center for Japanese Studies of University of Michigan. I was invi invited uh, for around four years ago, but uh, because of the uh, COVID-19, I uh, could not uh, be here at that time. This is my uh, first uh, visit abroad after the COVID pandemic, indeed. Also, University of Michigan is a special place for me, for which uh, Professor Gary Stackson has worked for a long time. I first met Gary in 1989, and since then I have learned a lot uh, and been deeply inspired by his uh, insightful research. Uh, my talk today is on the Japanese uh, cotton spinning industry, on which Gary published a great article when he was young. Uh, in these senses, I'm very happy to be here indeed. Uh, Josh kindly introduced me, but let me give a brief uh, self-introduction of my research. I have been working on uh, economic history uh, research focusing on modern Japan since uh, the uh, 1980s, when I was a graduate uh, school student. 
I have studied a variety of issues, including history of the steel industry, uh, financial history, evolution of institutions, and so on. And my recent research interest, uh, as I wrote in the slide, uh, innovation, farm dynamics, and productivity change, industrial policy, and uh, the war economy. I uh, listed uh, my uh, recent paper in the slide. Uh, out of them, the paper with Bravinsky and two other co-authors uh, in 2015 explores uh, the uh, impact of farm mergers or reallocation of, of uh, ownership, plant ownership, using detailed uh, plant-level data on the cotton spinning industry in Meiji, uh, Japan. And the paper in uh, 2021 with the same co-authors investigate the mechanism of product innovation and farm growth, uh, also using the data on the cotton spinning in Meiji, uh, Japan. Um, meanwhile, my paper in uh, 2021 uh, measures the effect of technological and organizational changes under the industrial revolution uh, separately to find that technological and organizational changes had pro productivity impact with almost the same magnitude. Another research interest uh, is on uh, uh, the industrial policy. The paper with Onishi and Wakamori focuses on the policy to uh, dispose excess product capacity uh, in 1980s uh, Japan. And the paper with Okubo and Tomiura focuses the policy to organize uh, industrial clusters. Then the third research interest is on the war economy in the 1930s and 1940s. The paper I'm presenting today is related to this research interest. Uh, the paper I'm presenting uh, today is this one, which has been published online uh, in Economic History Review uh, very uh, recently. Uh, titled Designing Wartime Econ Economic Controls, Productivity, and Farm Dynamics in the Japanese Cotton Spinning Industry. Uh, this paper is related to the large literature on the war economy during the Second World War. Uh, research on the war economy during the Second World War started as early as just after the war. And since the Ukrainian war, uh, economic historian and econ uh, economists have been newly interested in, in the topic of uh, war and economy. In the literature, one new strand of research is the uh, research on the micro aspect of the war economy. Uh, this strand of, of uh, literature include uh, Badras and Kosa's paper, which focuses on fixed price contract as a device for enhancing productivity in the German aircraft industry, and the Streps paper that addresses negotiation on contract types in the German construction industry. Uh, in my uh, 2011 paper, I studied outsourcing of aircraft parts production in Japan. Uh, this strand reflects the development of microeconomics as well as availability of historical information at the micro uh, level. Uh, today's uh, paper is in the same uh, vein. That is, I focus on uh, the evolution of the scheme of economic controls through trial and error. More specifically, I'm interested in uh, the adoption of a control scheme intentionally incorporating elements of market mechanism. The object of the paper is uh, the cotton industry in Japan. Uh, this is one of the largest industries uh, in Pure Japan, large in terms of employment, uh, import of raw materials, and export of products. In addition uh, to the convenience of uh, researchers, uh, detailed farm level data are available, which enable us, enables us to investigate uh, the implications of economic controls. 
Uh, let us look at the uh, historical background briefly. Uh, in terms of the political and the military history, the early 1930s is characterized as the period when Japan started to expand its power to the East Asia. And this caused conflicts with Western countries as well as China. That is, in September uh, 1931, utilizing the Tiao Lake incident as a trigger, the Japanese army invaded into Manchuria and founded a puppet country, Manchukuo. And responding to the criticism to this invasion, Japan withdrew from the League of Nations in 1933. Uh, also, Japan uh, denounced the Washington Naval Treaty in 1934. On the other hand, with respect to the economic history, the early 1930s is known as a period of uh, economic recovery from the Great Depression. Under the careful policy management by the government, specifically by the finance minister, uh, Korekio Takahashi. But uh, this stable recovery and growth came to an end by the political event called uh, February uh, 26 incident, where uh, several government and military uh, dignitaries were assassinated, uh, including Takahashi by young army officers and soldiers. Uh, Takahashi was targeted because of he suppressed the uh, military expenditure. Um, this is uh, summary statistics of the Japanese macroeconomy. The blue line denote the growth rate of real GNP, while the, uh, the orange line uh, denote the percentage of government expenditure in GNP. As you see, in 1930 and 1931, growth rate was around zero, which reflects the Great Depression. But from 1932, growth rate increased substantially. Uh, this is due to the change in the macroeconomic policy initiated by Takahashi. Uh, Takahashi's policy is, is reflected in the increase in the percentage of government expenditure in GNP. But it is notable that after the economic recovery, Takahashi reduced uh, government expenditure to stabilize the economy. Um, <clears throat> uh, the military expenditure was reduced uh, as well. Well, February 26 incident made it difficult for the government to control military budget anymore and triggered sharp increase in military expenditure, as we can see in the orange line from 1937 in this uh, figure. Expansion of government expenditure was reflected in large deficit in international balance of payments as shown in the gap between import uh, and export, uh, between the uh, gray line and the orange line. Uh, in looking at the balance of payments, uh, it is important to distinguish the yen block and non-yen block because for the trade with yen block area, foreign currency was not needed. And it is also notable that the yen block was expanded uh, in this period, reflecting the expansion of the territory under Japan's control, as uh, summarized in the next uh, slide. Uh, until the foundation of Manchukuo in 1932, yen was used in Japan, and Japan's colonies, and Canton district. Canton district was leased to Japan from China after the Russo Japanese War in 19, uh, 1905. After the foundation of Manchukuo in 1932, uh, the yen block was expanded to Manchuria. Then after Japan's invasion into northern part of China, uh, it was expanded to uh, northern part of China. Uh, in this figure, Japan's balance of payments is shown by a currency block. The blue line indicates the balance with yen block, and the orange line indicate that with non-yen block. As you see here, 
while the balance uh, with the block continued to be in surplus, the balance with non yen block was basically in deficit. In other words, Japan was basically uh, faced with shortage of foreign currency. And from the end of 1936, the deficit uh, increased sharply. Increase in the deficit of balance of payment with non yen block was reflected in the decline in the stock of foreign currency or gold. The blue line uh, denotes the stock of gold held by the Bank of Japan, while the uh, orange line uh, denotes the, the stock of gold held by the Japanese government. Faced with the sharp decline in the stock of gold, the Japanese government chose to adopt uh, economic controls to uh, defend uh, the stock of gold. Uh, economic controls, controls started from a licensing system of foreign exchange in January 1937, uh, given uh, the situation I've just uh, talked. Uh, six months after that, the Second Sino-Japanese War broke out in July 1937, and then uh, economic controls were expanded to uh, various areas of the uh, economy, including uh, distribution of commodities, fund allocation, and allocation of labor force, and so forth. When the deficit in balance of payments increased, the government had two alternative choices, namely uh, depreciation of yen and the licensing of foreign exchange. The government chose the licensing system, actually. The reasons for this, uh, as I wrote in the slide, um, the, the government had concern for triggering acceleration of uh, the, the devaluation of yen uh, would uh, a trigger acceleration of inflation and uh, expansion of, of military power uh, and production capacity, uh, which were two primary goals for the government, needed a large um, amount of import. And uh, given the regulations of international trade by major uh, countries, uh, they could not uh, expect increase in export by depreciation Uh, in, start, in starting the licensing system, uh, Minister, Minister of Finance announced, uh, please cooperate with us on the licensing system, whether uh, you are waiting or not, because maintaining the yen exchange rate is an important national policy. Uh, this statement suggests how important maintaining exchange rate is. The focus of the foreign exchange licensing system was uh, import of low cotton, which is the focus of this paper as well. Let us see the structure of the cotton industry uh, very uh, briefly. Uh, the cotton industry was composed of two basic uh, subcategories of industry, namely cotton spinning and cotton weaving. Low cotton is spun to be cotton yarn in the cotton spinning industry, and cotton yarn is weaved to be cotton fabric in the cotton weaving industry. It is notable that the structure of the cotton spinning industry and the cotton weaving industry were substantially different. The cotton spinning industry was basically composed of large farms, which cotton weave, uh, while, while cotton weaving industry had numerous small farms besides large farms in, uh, integrated with cotton spinning. As summarized uh, in this table in 1936, there are uh, 44 farms and uh, 111 plants in the cotton spinning industry. Uh, on the, uh, 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 on the other hand, there were more than uh, 46,000 plants in the cotton weaving uh, industry. 
The raw material of the cotton industry, raw cotton, was uh, mostly imported from non-Yen bloc, including the U.S. and India. The blue line denotes the total import from uh, import from non-Yen bloc, and the orange line denotes the raw cotton imp import from non-Yen bloc. As you see in this uh, figure, raw cotton accounted for a substantial part of the total input from the non-Yen bloc to Japan. A problem for the government was cotton fabric and the garments were one of the major goods exported from Japan to non-Yen bloc. So the government wanted to reduce the raw cotton import while maintaining and increasing cotton product export as much as possible. With this background, the licensing system of low cotton import started. Using the licensing system, the government restricted low cotton import as written uh, in this uh, slide. And given the restriction, the government uh, instructed the Industrial Association of Cotton Spinning, namely Japan Cotton Spinners Association, to reduce cotton yarn production. Japan Cotton Spinners Association was a powerful uh, industrial association that was founded in the late 19th century and worked as a cultural since then. Since then. Uh, given the instruction, the Japan Cotton Spinners Association decided a scheme for, uh, for allocating low cotton to member firms. I summarized the main points of this scheme as A, B, C, and D in this uh, slide. Uh, the scheme is a bit complicated, but in brief, the scheme was allocating low cotton based on each firm's uh, production capacity or production equipment. Uh, reduction of uh, cotton yarn production caused shortage of cotton yarn, and hence the government adopted other controls, uh, including uh, distribution control, uh, price control. Also, uh, mixing stable fibers, uh, chemical fibers to cotton yarn uh, 30% or more was obliged. In other words, the Japanese people will not be able to buy a 100% cotton product anymore. Uh, let us observe the, uh, the consequences of the controls by aggregate, aggregate statistics. Uh, this table indicates supply and demand of cotton public from uh, a Cotton public, sorry. From 1937 to uh, 1938, production of cotton public uh, declined substantially. Uh, this is reflected in decline in export and domestic consumption of, of, of cotton public. What was undesirable for the government was export to non yen bloc declined sharply at the same time. It means that restriction of low cotton import did not uh, contribute to improving balance of payment with non-yen block areas. Uh, in early 1938, a shortage of foreign exchange became still more critical. To cope with this problem, a new scheme for controlling the cotton industry was introduced. That is the export import link system, which uh, we are interested in in this uh, paper. Export here was not only export of cotton yarn, but also included uh, cotton fabric made of the cotton yarn. In order to identify that a certain lot of cotton yarn produced by a certain spinning farm was supplied to a certain weaving farm to produce cotton fabric, and this fabric was exported to non-yen block. All the cotton weaving firms were registered as subcontractors of a certain cotton spinning farm. That is, cotton weaving plants should be either 
those owned by cotton spinning firms or those of cotton weaving firms registered as sub subcontract subcontractor of certain uh, cotton spinning firm. It is notable that this system was intentionally designed by the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, and that the Ministry uh, intended to incorporate the element of market mechanism in the system of economic control. Uh, this is indicated in the citation from a book written by Yoji Minobe, the chief of uh, the textile industry section, the Ministry of uh, Commerce and uh, Industry. Uh, he wrote, um, as I uh, cited, the individual ring system aims at making firms uh, demonstrate uh, their ability freely under this system and constraint such as production uh, allotment by cartes or industrial association uh, abolished as much as possible and by the free competition and the survival of the fittest, the, uh, the abilities of uh, excellent firms are fully utilized. Thus, those firms with excellent equipment and technology or with high effort level would have the chance to fully operate their equipment and thereby uh, decline in the export price of the product and an increase in uh, international competitiveness will be achieved. Uh, this is uh, the advantage of this system. Uh, this is, uh, you know, citation from uh, bureaucrats' uh, book. It is interesting that uh, this change was clearly recognized by private firms, as we see in the next uh, slide. Uh, this is a citation from a business report of uh, Kishiwada Bose, that is the, uh, one of the major uh, cotton uh, spinning firms. That's, uh, the report write, the individual ring system of cotton fabric export announced at the end of this term has caused a huge sensation in the cotton industry because uh, it fundamentally transforms the existing system of the cotton industry as far as export of cotton fabric is concerned, the link system brings, brings back free competition in the past. The future of the, of the industry has changed again to be uncertain. Now, this is a citation from the business report of Kishiwada uh, Cotton Spinning uh, Corporation. Uh, <clears throat> That is, uh, from the standpoint of a cotton spinning farm, this system revived market competition. Uh, this system stimulated export of cotton fabric to non-yen block as indicated in the next uh, slide. Uh, this uh, slide uh, is the... Uh, 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 is the uh, production and, and export of uh, cotton uh, uh, product. And as you see uh, from the uh, 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 second term of uh, 1938, uh, export to non-EM block uh, increased again. To explore the microeconomic implication of the uh, uh, export import link system, we first measure productivity of each cotton spinning firm. The data source is a document by Japan Cotton Spinners Association, uh, namely appendix table of the monthly bulletin of Japan Cotton Spinners Association. For major period, uh, this source is well known to economic historians and have been widely used. For the 1930s, similar tables are available as well. But unfortunately, some key data are not reported, unlike for the major period, period, including business days, business hours, wage by gender. But I found that Japan Cotton Spinners Association continued to collect these data and recorded them for inner use. And I collected 
uh, scattered in, uh, internal documents to construct a data set to measure uh, productivity precisely. Using the data and the standard methodology by Ole and Pix, I estimated uh, production function like this. Uh, I included a couple of uh, variable, variables specific to the cotton spinning industry in this uh, period, like uh, uh, Count is uh, uh, count of cotton yarn. That is the uh, the uh, uh, finesse of the cotton yarn. And non-cotton is the uh, the ratio of uh, intermediary input other than low cotton. Uh, using this uh, variable, I estimated this uh, uh, Cobb Douglas type uh, production function. Uh, this is an estimation result. The science and the magnitude of the capital and labor are reasonable and statistically significant. And using the estimated uh, coefficient, we can calculate TFP as uh, residual like this. Uh, meanwhile, uh, labor productivity is measured after adjusting the effect of count and mixture of low, uh, raw, ma raw materials other than low cotton, like uh, uh, that I, I, I uh, wrote uh, in this uh, slide. And using the productivity data, we compare uh, the implications of uh, government uh, controls. Uh, in order to uh, compare uh, the implication of the government uh, controls, we identify three regimes of controls. The first one is the regime before the control starts. Uh, in other words, regime one is a regime of market economy. Regime two is from first half of 1937 to first half of 1938. In this period, so to speak, a naive control system was implemented. Finally, regime three is a regime of the export import ring system. In order to see the economic implication of each regime, we focus on the relationship between the production growth and the productivity of each firm. That is, we estimate the following equation uh, as I, I uh, show in this uh, slide. Uh, this uh, uh, equation relates uh, production growth of each firm to its productivity. Here we control for the event that a firm experienced a uh, merger or exit during a half, during a half year. Uh, this is the, uh, the estimation result. Uh, in case we use TFP as the production uh, productivity measure, standard errors uh, in parentheses. In this case, the coefficient on TFP are not significant, uh, except for regime two. It might be because marginal cost of capital is not taken into account uh, in short-term decision of production. Uh, this is uh, the result in case we use labor productivity as the productivity measure. In regime one and regime three, regime one and, and regime three, uh, the coefficients on labor productivity are positive and significant. It is uh, while it is negative and si significant in regime two. That is under the market economy, Firm with higher labor productivity tended to grow faster, and this relationship disappeared when the economic control started. However, after the, the introduction of export import link system, the positive association between uh, labor productivity and production growth revived. Uh, this is the uh, summary of the result. Um, uh, this, this pattern of firm dynamics would be reflected 
in the change in the average labor productivity, which we uh, explore uh, next. Uh, to see that we apply the decomposition formula by uh, Foster and Coasas. Within effect is the, uh, the portion of average labor productivity change accounted for by productivity change of each firm, given that the each firm's market share is fixed uh, as that in the initial year. On the other hand, a between effect is that the portion of average labor productivity change accounted for by the difference in the market share change uh, changes across the, uh, the firm with different labor productivity in the initial year. Covariance effect is the interaction of labor productivity change uh, of each, each firm and the market share change. Uh, exit uh, effect uh, is the portion accounted for by the difference of uh, labor productivity between surviving firms and existing firms. Uh, so, uh, sorry, <laughs> surviving firms and exiting firms. Uh, entry effect is the uh, portion accounted for by the difference of labor productivity between uh, existing firms and the newly uh, entering firms. Uh, the effects except for, except for within effect are more or less related to farm, farm dynamics, namely share change, entry, exit, uh, entry and exit, and we can uh, <clears throat> Uh, summarize it as the uh, reallocation effect. Uh, this is the, uh, the decomposition result. Well, we decompose the total labor productivity change into within effect and other for uh, reallocation effect. Uh, we can uh, find the uh, interesting uh, difference uh, across the, uh, the regime. In regime one, uh, under market economy, around one third of, of the average increase in labor productivity was composition effect. Regime two, under the uh, naive control economy, uh, <clears throat> composition effect was almost zero. And regime three, under export import link system, more than half of the average increase in labor productivity change was composition effect as I show uh, in this uh, table. And this is the summary of, of what I uh, talked uh, using the previous uh, table. I don't think uh, we need to repeat again. So um, uh, let me uh, conclude the paper. Uh, from 1937, the Japanese government adopted uh, foreign exchange controls to achieve balance of, uh, of international payments, maintaining exchange rate and expansion of fiscal expenditure at the same time. Uh, in the import control, low cotton was a major target. We focused on the evolution of the system of economic control through uh, trial and error. That is, uh, uh, that is, at first, the government applied a naive uh, control system, but as this system did not contribute to improving uh, balance of payments with non em block, a new scheme was adopted. Uh, that is uh, the export import ring system which was designed to incorporate an element of market economy to the economic control system. We evaluated uh, the implications of regime of uh, economic controls using farm level data to find that the export import link system indeed emulated the market mechanism. And this is reflected in the pattern of farm dynamics and uh, productivity change. Um, these are the, the reference I, I uh, <clears throat> used uh, in the paper. So that is, uh, thank you very much.
Thank you. So we'll take questions at this point, um, both from in the room and on the Zoom. Um, Yes, thank you. I, this was very informative. I learned a lot and I'll have questions later, but um, it seems like what they wanted to do in some sense was keep exporting yarn or yarn and cloth and tie and reduce imports that were not generating foreign exchange. Did they think of some other licensing where you would be allowed to import freely if you exported? That would seem to be even more direct. Uh, so, so if you exported, you got like a license and then you could go import as much as you wanted. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, the export, uh, import, uh, export and uh, import rig system. I mean, that uh, uh, if a firm, uh, you know, export uh, its product, uh, uh, that firm could, uh, 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 is given. Uh, more license to, to, uh, but that is the, uh, the, you know, implication of that uh, system. Yes. Uh, I'll ask a question. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. It looked like on one of the slides, like, uh, with non export of cotton, the internal use of cotton, black consumption. Mm -hmm. And was that intentional? It looked like you could, they only wanted people importing if they were then going to export. They didn't want the import. Produced for the domestic. Industry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. They didn't want people importing to produce for the domestic market. Is that true? Um, yes. Uh, you know, actually, the the government restricted the you know domestic use of of uh, product u using the uh, imported raw materials. So, in that sense, the you know uh, the decline in the domestic consumption of of uh, cotton fabric, uh, was intentional and, uh, the consequence of the uh, government control. And did that cause where, where people, was that sort of accepted by the Japanese public or was this sort of, uh, yeah, that's a, I, I, I think they did, um, um, have uh, frustration, but the, uh, at that time, you know, the, the Japanese government and the Japanese uh, army is very, you know, authoritative and, uh, you know, Suppressing, so they, uh, the Japanese people, uh, could not help accepting that uh, uh, regulation. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm wondering, kind of a, uh, uh, about sort of the the potential long-term effect on the productivity of the industry that would have happened obviously you know the maybe like a few years later than the the period you covered i mean the you know the the world war well i mean i think the the war between japan and the us mm -hmm. occurred and things completely changed but i was wondering you know because you know it, this system seems to be um you know uh like considering the the import of raw materials and the export of um you know the production but uh i was i was wondering like how they how they were doing about so sort of for example the production facilities and the machines or things like that um cuz my sort of you know, poor knowledge about the Japanese economy in, in the pre-war period is that they were importing a lot of production facilities and machines. And, you know, in order to do that, they need to uh, import things. And, you know, this scheme doesn't seem to think about that. And I was, so, so was it, was it actually like, would it have been sustainable for the long term? And if they, mm -hmm. if the, if the firms wanted to sort of expand the, the production, uh, capacity or something, like what could have, what could they 
have done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think the uh, image period, you know, uh, Japan uh, should import all the, you know, cotton spinning machines and cotton weaving machine from uh, the Europe. But uh, in 19, in the 1930s, uh, already uh, Japan could produce those machines uh, domestically. So in that sense, uh, I don't think the uh, uh, equipment was not a restriction uh to uh, you know expand uh, uh export of cotton product so thanks mm. yeah actually the uh toyota uh was one of the major producer of cotton or weaving machine and, and that is the origin of the uh, toyota automobile Uh, hello. So thank you so much for coming all the way from uh, Tokyo. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the talk. I want to ask, since I have an interest in uh, Manchukuo, uh, I know that there was some kind of production in Manchukuo. Were there ever like large efforts to uh, like support kind of production within the yen block itself to reduce the imports or was that not feasible? Mm. Yes. Um you know, uh, in Manchukuo, you know, Japan uh, made a great effort to uh, develop industries uh, there, especially uh, the industries uh, for uh, munitions uh, production. So uh, for that purpose, Japan should export a lot to Manchukuo. So in that sense, uh, uh, development of Manchukuo and Manchurian area uh, did not contribute to the uh, 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 improvement of uh, of uh, balance of payment of Japan. Uh, it's you know worked to the uh, different direction. So it's a uh, so to speak a burden for a Japanese economy. I was wondering if you could. If it's possible to say anything about what the free market alternative would have been, so I suppose one hadn't imposed mm -hmm. any controls and the yen had been allowed to simply flow through everything. Mm -hmm. so that was not saying that it would have happened, would have been done in the 30s. But if the Japanese government had done that, oh, oh. sorry, <laughs> I'm not very good. Uh, um, how different would the outcomes have been? Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to to um, to answer, but uh, uh, but the, uh, the the Japanese government expected at that time, anticipated at that time was the uh, if uh, they um, uh, did not uh, uh, choose the uh, economic controls and uh, uh, maintain market mechanisms the yen uh, de depreciated uh, substantially and the inflation accelerated and uh, uh, the Japanese economy uh, would collapse. Uh, it's it's the expectation, anticipation. Uh, I am not sure uh, that uh, the expe expectation uh, it was correct or not, but uh, uh, that was what they, they anticipated. So I think uh, you may uh, investigate the uh, that uh, uh, if uh, the consequence. Uh, so using the uh, macroeconomic model or something like that. So it's I think a uh, interesting question. I think. And just within the cotton industry, suppose mm -hmm. they. I oh, this one isn't working at all. Oh. Interesting. Are you sure it's not me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this just okay. Thank you. Um, okay, this, yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, within the cotton industry itself, do you think that these controls were effective at leading to more exports than you would have had, you know, in a world where suppose you hadn't, you just sort of let firms do what they want to do and and allocate sort of foreign exchange and, and some just sort of across the board, say, give everyone what they had at sort of 1937 or something. 
Um, do, do you think this was really effective at increasing exports relative to what what they otherwise would have been? Mm, I think the uh, uh, the product price uh, in Manchuria and the other yen block uh, uh, regions uh, increased substantially in this period. So I think the uh, private firms uh, wanted to uh, you know sell wanted to sell their product to those yen block areas. So that was uh, what uh, actually happened. So I think the, uh, if there was uh, no uh, control, uh, the, uh, the export to yen block increased uh, much more and the uh, export to non-yen block uh, is much smaller than actually occurred. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I, I learned a lot um, from your talk. It's not really an area of specialty for me. Um, but um, I, I had a, a question I was wondering if, if I could ask you about. Um, it seems like you're suggesting that this uh, export-import link system uh, substantially increased the um, imports and exports um, after implementation mm. and um, for the non-yen block. And I was wondering if you could talk about the non-yen block a little bit in terms of changes. Um, were there changes in the composition of the non-yen block uh, after that point of time um, that might explain increases in export activity? For example, uh, were there closer connections then with access countries that might explain uh, higher exports uh, and, and things like that. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the subject, so a anything that you could say to shed some light on that would be uh, helpful for me. Thank you. Mm. Uh, I, I, sorry, I cannot get your point. So, uh, well, um, just um, were there changes in the composition of uh, the non-yen block in terms of the countries that uh, Japan was tra trading with? Um, did uh, closer connections with access countries, for mm, example, mm. Um, could that help explain increases in exports uh, mm. and imports? Mm. Okay. Yeah, there are a lot of data on, on that uh, point, but uh, uh, I have no idea at, at this. Uh, I don't have the data now, so I cannot uh, answer that question. Sorry, I don't know. Um, um, but it, it's an interesting question, I think. Thank you. Well, if we don't, oh. So um, I, I, I know this question is kind of a beyond the, <laughs> the scope of this mm -hmm. research, but I'm what, what I mean, I have sort of two kind of a like a generalizability question. So one is, um, you know, did Japan try or actually did a similar thing on other industries? And two, um, you know, like, can this be still like a potentially doable policy now in some other countries? Like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we we are we are seeing we are mm -hmm. now seeing, um, like one country probably doing a war economy, and so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, what what can we learn from this case right. about that? Right. Yeah. This, you know, scheme is for uh, basically for the, uh, the industry, uh, uh, exporting industry using, uh, imported raw materials, right? So this kind of industry, uh, at that time was, uh, wool industry in Japan. So, uh, the Japanese government applied the similar scheme to the, uh, the wool, uh, industry, uh, in the 1930s. And, uh, applicability to the, the, you know, the pleasant, uh, war, uh, or, uh, or economic country, I think it is uh, doable. So, but, uh, uh, in order to, you know, implement this scheme, uh, effectively, uh, the government should have some, you know, a high, uh, managing ability, you know, in, in, in the case of cotton spinning industry in Japan, 
uh, the Japanese government used the uh, industry association, industry association, uh, cotton uh, spinners association as a tool to implement this uh, scheme. So uh, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure uh, is needed to uh, implement this kind of uh, scheme effectively. So I'm not sure that uh, the country you have in mind has has this kind of, uh, you know, uh, ability. So I, I think um, there's no other questions. I think we'll wrap up. Thank you so much. This was um, fantastic. I learned a huge amount, as I think we, we all did. And uh, let's give uh, another round of applause. Thank you very much.